You're listening to the Fresh Hell Podcast. Fresh Hell contains stories of a disturbing and often graphic nature and is intended for a mature audience. Please don't let your kids listen to this, or they might turn out like us. Hey, true crime fans. Have you listened to Wine and Crime yet? We're a true crime comedy podcast hosted by three childhood friends who chug wine, chat true crime, and unleash our worst Minnesotan accents. Each week, us gals pick a true crime topic and pair it with a delicious wine before delving into the background and psychology behind the crime. Then we share and speculate wildly about a couple of bonkers cases related to the topic. Past episodes include necrophilia, cults, Crimes of passion, cruise ship disappearances, exorcisms gone wrong, all this over a bottle of wine, or let's be real, three. Listen anywhere you get your podcasts. You can also follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Wine and Crime Pod, and check out our website and blog at wineandcrimepodcast.com. Cheers! Okay, well, now I want a glass of wine. Yeah, me too. So those were the girls from Wine and Crime. They know a lot more about wine than I do. (laughs) And they have the best accents. Minnesota, eh? (laughs) It's a really fun show. I listen to them, especially if I've had like a bad run health-wise and I haven't seen anyone but my wonderful husband and my doctors for a few weeks, sometimes months. Listening to their show, it's one of those shows where you just feel like you're hanging out with old friends. Yeah, I've been subscribed for a while. Check them out. Well, that Uh, sounds like something right up my alley, so I'd say, uh, subscribed. Yeah, definitely. Listen to them later. Uh, I know you're going to love them, but right now we are here for another Fresh Hell episode. Uh, that's right, because obviously this is Fresh Hell. I'm Johanna. And I'm Annie, and we are very happy that you've tuned in for another episode. So maybe this is your first time that you're listening to us and you have no idea what to expect. So we are two friends who never met in real life and we cover not only true crime cases from all around the world, but also everything mysterious and macabre. If you like to listen to two friends having a well-researched conversation about these topics, you came to the right place. That's right. And you're in Austria and I'm in Boston. So uh, not only have we never met, we're on different continents. Our format's a little flexible. So if we both know a topic well, we'll tell you about it together because otherwise it would be weird. Uh, <laughs> and sometimes to, like today, one of us will tell the other a story about a case they don't know. So hopefully this makes sense to you or it will eventually. And that being said, Johanna, what are we going to talk about today? Well, this week's episode covers a case that is very well known in Germany, and it's rather recent, so not one of our old-timey cases. The crimes came to light in 2016, and the trial only ended in 2018, so last year. Wow. Yeah, that's very recent for us. So is there anything that we need to know about before we start? Any warnings? Well, this case involves a lot of torture, gaslighting and abusive relationships. So if it is hard for you to listen to these things, you might want to sit this one out. There's another thing I want you to know. Often in contemporary cases, we don't know the last names of many of the victims and the offenders. The names for this case have leaked on the Internet. And I even read one article where they were named. But because in most of the official reports that I found their last name was not named, I shall refer to them by their first names. And I just want to make absolutely clear that this is not because I want to evoke any sympathy in the two offenders. Oh, right. Sure. So why is that? You often only know the first names. Well, I think here in Austria and Germany, it is based on the Presse Codex, which is basically the ethical rules the media follows. So each case is different and also each media outlet might handle the same case a little bit different. But in general, whenever the last name is not mentioned anywhere it is, because it would either negatively affect the family of the criminals or because it would make later rehabilitation impossible. Now, why it was done in this case, I honestly don't know. I tried to find further information, but I I couldn't. So if anybody out there knows more about it, please message us. 
Here, I think it's really commonly done um, with the names of victims, right? So they would not release the full names of a victim to protect their privacy. But with the offenders, I think unless the offender is a minor, they'll pretty much always use the full name here. So what is the name of this case? Well, it is usually referred to as the Horror House of Höxter. Oh, well, that sounds bad. <laughs> when you start right out with a horror house, it's like, all right. <laughs> well, one could think it's it's a haunting or something like this, but no, it's not. It's it's really, it's it's bad. It's very okay. bad. So, Höxter, being a city in North Rhine-Westfalen or North Rhine-Westphalia in English, which is a German state. The city Höxter has a population of approximately 30,000 people. But the house that we are talking about is in Höxter Bosseborn, which is the smallest part of the town. Now, I didn't find the exact number online, but it has around 500 people living there. If you look at the photos, it's a very rural area, quiet, you know, safe. The neighbors know each other. Yeah, so a nice, quiet, normal suburban neighborhood. Call um, it that. Um, um. <laughs> You could definitely call it that. But on 27th of April 2016, when the police started to search the house of Wilfried and Angelika W. for evidence, life in a quiet suburban area would change for good. Ah, uh, okay. So what were the names? Wilfried and Angelika. Wilfried and Angelika. So mm -hmm. are they the, they're the bad guys in this story? Yes. So, let's talk about Wilfried first. Okay. He was born 1970 and he had to attend a special needs school due to severe difficulties with reading and writing. Now, I don't think that Wilfried suffered from dyslexia because later on during the trial, experts determined that he had an IQ of 59, which is below average because usually an IQ between it depends on, on your sources it's either 85 or 90 and 109 is considered to be average now with 59 Wilfred was way below that oh yeah so IQ of 59 he's he's well below average he'd he'd maybe have trouble with a lot of things yeah yeah, and we will definitely talk more about, um, you know, the expert report on Wilfred's mental issues a little bit later. But now talk a little bit more about his adult years. So in his early adult years, he tried a few different things. First, he wanted to become a dog handler and started training with the British Army of the Rhine. And now I had to look this up myself. The British Army of the Rhine or Rhine Garrison was the British occupation forces in Germany after both world wars. And what I didn't know is that the Rhine garrison only ended their mission in Germany after the end of the Cold War in 1994. Oh, well, that's okay. I also didn't know that. I didn't know any of that, actually. So, yeah. <laughs> Learn something new today again? Every Here day. At Fresh Hill. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> so, Wilfried started a training to become a dog handler, but this continued it shortly after to help his mother and his stepfather on the family farm. And after that, he became a car mechanic. Okay, so he's not so intellectually disabled that he, you know, can't work. He's obviously a functioning adult, at least. Yeah, it yeah. looks like it. But also he couldn't hold a job for a long time. Honestly, most of the time he was living on, on welfare and on the money that he received from his victims. Uh, okay, okay. In 1991, he met a woman named Michaela and he started to have a relationship with her. This relationship continued even though in 1994 he met another woman who he married shortly after. Oh, all right. Well, normally I'd feel badly for Michaelia, but uh, I'm guessing she was lucky? Yeah. So right now we will get to see what kind of person Wilfried really is. Okay, here it goes. Please brace yourself. Okay. So <laughs> Wilfred got married to the woman who met him through an ad in a newspaper in the summer of 1994. And even though her family was against the relationship, they married rather fast. Their family was against relationship, rightfully so, I'd say, because only one month after their wedding, Wilfred started to get physically abusive. And it all started with a burnt meal. So when Wilfred saw that his wife had burned the sausages for lunch, he started to strangle her until she fainted. And from that day on, he abused her, raped her, humiliated her. He often used boxing gloves to beat her. And afterwards, he said he wanted to help her heal the bruises with a hairdryer. Oh. He also burned his wife with an iron one day when she was driving the car, for example, and she refused to go over the speed limit. He just bit her nose and ears until she started bleeding heavily. Oh, my God. That's horrific. That poor woman. 
Yeah, but that's not all. So he had his mistress Michaela move in with them, and now they started to torture his wife together. <sighs> that bitch. I was just feeling sorry for her, too. I did not see that coming. Yeah. This is awful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Michaela moved into the bedroom with Wilfried while his young wife had to sleep in the living room, which, I mean, let's face it, might have been a relief. Seriously. Yeah. They used to tie her up and force her to dance in front of them. They beat and burned her. And one day, Wilfred sexually assaulted his wife with a plastic pipe while his mistress cheered him on. Uh, God, that's just unbelievably infuriating and sad. Did she, um, did she ever make an effort to get away? Yes. So the wife tried to leave, but Wilfred threatened to kill her family if she would run away. So she stayed. But thankfully, her family sensed that, you know, something bad was going on and they were able to free her. Oh, thank God. That's a relief. So during the trial that ensued, Wilfried, Michaela and their lawyers managed to humiliate his wife further. So the defense stated that this was all a lie by his, quote, hysterical wife, planned as a revenge for being left for another woman. Thank God the judge didn't believe any of this. The judge stated that he never before had heard such a conclusive and credible witness report. The injuries matched her statement and there even existed an eyewitness report by an elderly neighbor who had seen through the bedroom window at one point and saw how Wilfred had forced his wife to crawl on all four while saying, I'm your servant. In the end, he was sentenced to two years and nine months and Michaela was sentenced to one year on probation. Oh my God. That's not enough time. Holy hell, we need prison reform in just so many ways. Oh, God, this is this is awful. Please continue. I agree. The sentence is way too light. But unfortunately, yeah. back at the time, there was no such thing as rape in a marriage. So he was never charged for the sexual attacks. Mm -hmm. Yep, that is all too familiar. So, all right, so I'm a little confused. You mentioned a woman named Angelica in the mm -hmm. beginning. So that wasn't his wife. No, the name of the first wife is unknown to protect her privacy. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, that makes sense. Okay, so, but then we were talking about Michaela, his mistress, and then you'd said at first, so the trial took place in 2018, but this all happened in the 90s. So is that, that's the end of the story? I, I really wish it was, but unfortunately, this was just a prologue. I should have realized that. It always gets worse. Mm, yeah, I know. I mean, what can I tell you? It is what it is. It's what we're here for. So, Wilfred served his time in jail and after his release, he started to place Lonely Hearts ads in newspapers and magazines again. And that's how he met Angelica in 1999. Now let's talk a little bit about Angelica. She too was born in 1970, just like Wilfred, and she too grew up on a farm where she had to help with chores from a very early age, similar to Wilfred. But unlike Wilfred, she has an IQ of 120, which is considered to be way above average. In her childhood, she was very kind to animals. Um, she also was described as being very level-headed, frugal, with a good memory and a high sense of duty. She never had any friends, not as kid in school and not in later years. And after school, she became a gardener. Well, she sounds like someone I'd want as a friend. Yeah, you might want to hold that off for now, though. Oh no, these stories are always so hard. I feel like I'm always feeling sorry and sympathizing with the wrong person. Mm. It's like some weird town loner who then ends up eating everybody. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, honestly, let's say it like this. It looks like her love or her compassion for animals didn't continue in her adult life. But guys, you know us and this is something I really don't want to talk about in detail. Yeah, okay, she was cruel to animals. Got it, enough said. Okay. <laughs> so when Angelica's father died, her mother told her that now it was about time that she would find a husband and she urged her to answer some of the Lonely Hearts ads that single men had placed in the newspaper. And one of those men was, of course, Wilfried. Oh no. Oh, come on, mom. Jeez. So when she meets the man who has spent some years in prison and who is now deeply in debt, she tells him about herself and she tells him about her savings account, which was in total 80,000 euros. Because remember, she never liked to spend any money. Angelica falls head over heels for Wilfried and she will later on call it love at first sight. Only eight weeks later, Angelica and Wilfried get married. Wow. Okay. Did she know about his debt and prison time before they were married? Yes, apparently so, but she later stated that she didn't know exactly why he was in prison. Okay. 
So when they get married, he has already beaten her. And according to Angelica, the abuse continues throughout the marriage. She later states that he bites her breasts until she starts bleeding. He pours boiling water over her arms. He wraps her in thick blankets and lies on top of her until she nearly suffocates. Okay, that one is weird and very specific and mm -hmm. awful. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it, it's really bad. It's bad. After a while, Wilfried and Angelica start to place ads in newspapers again for Wilfried to find other women in Germany, in Czech Republic. Now, here it gets a little bit confusing. Bear with me. There is so much information out there because it's often like a he said, she said kind of situation. But in 2005 or other sources say 2003 or 2013, but I personally think 2005 is the correct year, the couple gets divorced for financial reasons, as they later say. But They stay together, and after moving from one place to another, they finally move into a house in Höxter Bosseborn. It is a former farmhouse. Now, Annie, mm. please don't get upset now, because this time I don't have any house porn for you. You know what? That's okay. I don't think there's enough sage in the world. <laughs> I mean, I just, I can't believe that he's done this again. Mm. I'm not sure how the house looked when the couple moved in. I'm pretty certain it was kind of a fixer-upper. Now, the only problem, the two, they didn't fix or up anything. So the house stays run down. The house doesn't have sufficient heating system. So inside it's often freezing cold and damp. The wallpaper stays barely on the wall. There's mold, dirt, garbage everywhere. In their neighborhood, they introduce themselves as brother and sister. And that's what they also tell all of the women who answer to Wilfrid's ads. Now the ads, they were all different. Like one time Wilfred is described as farmer looking for a wife. Another time he's a romantic biker, a fiery single with dark hair looking for a special someone to plan a future with. Angelica drives her ex-husband to his dates because he himself doesn't have a driver's license. Now, how many women he meets in total is unclear to this day, even though some have come forward after a couple's arrest. I read that the investigators know about six or seven women, but there might have been way more. So one of the first known victims is Anne-Marie. That's not her real name. That's the name that was given to her by newspapers. So, mm. you know, to protect her privacy. Yeah. Anne-Marie meets Wilfred in 2008 and their relationship lasts one year. Fortunately for her, she never moved in with Angelica and Wilfred, but she is still submissive. For example, the couple has total access to her bank account, her mail and her apartment. And when Wilfred threatens to kill her if she doesn't do as he says, she finally has enough and she flees to her brother who helps her to get away. Oh God, thank God she got away. Now, I just, I can't believe I've never heard about this case. This is awful. Please continue. Now, the next woman the couple meets later states that Wilfred was never abusive in any way. However, she gives him 15,000 euros, voluntarily, as she says, and to do so, she needs to borrow money from the bank. Now, their relationship ends when the woman starts to suffer from multiple sclerosis and she needs to go to the hospital. Wow. Well, that's probably the luckiest case of MS ever, huh? Uh, it looks like. Yeah. In 2011, the first woman moves in with Wilfried and Angelica. Her name is Crystal, and she too meets Wilfried through an ad in a newspaper. And the ad read something like, Farmer looking for wife. I'm kind, nice, and affectionate, and I'm searching for a woman to have a long-term relationship with. She likes the ad and decides to contact Wilfried. He probably sends her the picture he did send so many others. It shows him when he was a little bit younger, fitter, in tight, blue gym shorts lying on a couch. Oh, wait, sorry. Uh, did you just say he sprawled on a couch wearing tight blue gym shorts and, and women liked this? Apparently so. I don't get it either. I don't get any of this, to be honest. Yeah, fair enough. Okay. So Crystal, <laughs> like everybody else at that point, is convinced that Angelica is Wilfred's sister. And she, again, like the others before her, falls head over heels for him and soon decides to move in with the siblings and I'm using you know air quotes siblings yeah mm -hmm. <laughs> I guess she will never forget the day the two picked her up from her home they arrived with a white transporter is that the name you know like imagine one of those cars dog catchers drive oh yeah like a big panel van yeah exactly yeah so Angelica drives because as we said 
Wilfried can't. Wilfred is in the passenger seat and they tell Crystal to get in the back. And there she has to spend a five hour drive sitting on a box. Oh, no. I mean, I mean at least the couple is kind enough to hand her a blanket. Oh, okay. Such a gentleman, right? I, I, can, know. I can see where all the women fell for him. I, mean, I don't know how <laughs> just that didn't woo you immediately. Like, sit on this balance on a box in the back <laughs> of a murder van, please. Oh, wow. Okay. Not so, making, just wow. No, not at all. It's just like he he got away with such horrible behavior, and it, nice women just went with him. It's the worst. Okay. okay. So the first three weeks, everything is fine. Well, almost everything is fine. The three of them they sleep in the living room, and that's the only room in the house that is heated. So Wilfred and Crystal they sleep on the couch, and Angelica on a mattress on the floor. Okay, well, that's not at all awkward. Yeah, right. I mean, that's not something I would call fine, but I think they told Crystal that they are in the middle of renovations, I guess. She must have been thinking that the sleeping arrangements are just temporary. They shower once a week. They usually sleep most of the day, only wake up in the afternoon. And during the night, they feed the livestock. And I don't know, is it just me? Honestly, because does the thought that these people have animals living with them make everything so much worse? Yeah, that's bad. I don't want them having animals. I don't feel they deserve animals. I don't like them. I'm not happy about any of this. I think it's very bad. Yeah. No, they don't deserve animals. Yeah, they definitely don't deserve animals. So anyway, they feed the animals. All is dandy. Crystal is deeply in love with Wilfred and she's super happy at the house. Really? Yeah, I, I don't understand, but she wants to stay there forever. But then one day... Without a warning, Wilfred starts beating her. Mm. And Crystal cries and she wants to go home. And Wilfred tells her, you know what? Nobody's keeping you from leaving. The doors are open. Just go. But that's a lie because during the night, the doors are locked. And during the day, one of them is next to her at all times. They take her keys, her ID and her money. Crystal is trapped mm. from that day on. So the abusers get more and more cruel. Crystal is not allowed to use the bathroom during the night. She has to use a litter tray for cats. Angelica shaves off Crystal hair to, quote, make her ugly. She sprays her with pepper spray and sometimes chains her up in a pigsty, only dressed in her underpants. It's winter. Oh, my God. Wilfred forces her to lick his feet. No. And at one point, she has to sleep on the cold floor without any blankets or pillows. And then again... There are moments when Wilfred is nice, you know, nice as he was when they met. And it's as if he's a different person then. And when Crystal is later asked who was worse, Wilfred or Angelica, she answers both. And then, oh. after three months of torture, they let her go. Just like that. What? They, they take her to the train station and they make her sign a statement saying that all injuries were caused by accidents and that the couple had nothing to do with it. As a witness, they ask a random stranger at the train station to sign the statement too. I mean, imagine you are at the train station, you know, just minding your own business, reading a book or listening to music. And then these people approach you and they're like, hey, do you mind? We need a witness to sign this paper, you know, stating that this woman was injured in an accident. Not by us at all. And you're <laughs> just like, sure, no problem. Where do I sign? Like, seriously? I mean, honestly, who would do that? Definitely nobody listening to this podcast on their headphones at the train station. <laughs> this whole thing is just, it's so bizarre. It's like if it were a movie script, they'd tell you, no, sorry, this is too out there. No one would mm. ever believe this. You know, it's, wow. Who are these people? What? Who are how? these people? Yeah. Okay. So they put her on a train. Crystal's ordeal is finally over. Back at her apartment, she pushes the closet in front of the door and she didn't want to go out for a while. Perfectly understandable, I think. She also didn't go to the police out of fear Wilfred and Angelica would come back. They didn't, but to this day she keeps having nightmares involving one of the attacks in the sty she had to endure. Quote, I was cleaning. All of a sudden Wilfred was standing behind me and hit me with a shovel right in my face. When I was lying on the floor bleeding, he laughed and said, oh, that wasn't me. I will never forget this love, end quote. Okay. Well, that's absolute nightmare fuel. I absolutely understand uh, why she felt the way she did after that ordeal. And I'm just incredibly glad that uh, she survived. That's absolutely horrific. The next woman who moved into the rundown farmhouse in Höxter was not as lucky as Crystal. So once more, the couple placed an ad in the newspaper 
Annika, a 33-year-old nursing home employee, reads the ad during summer of 2013 and writes to Wilfried. They meet, and like all the other women before her, she soon falls in love. Annika doesn't even mind her boyfriend's weird and often very rude sister who lives with him. <laughs> and quickly, she decides to move in with Wilfried, who proposed to her with a ring from a drugstore. The two get married soon after, on 18th of October 2013. They get married in Höxta. Angelika, who waits outside of the city hall, she decorates the backseat of the car with wine leaves for the newlyweds. And after the ceremony, the three of them go out for breakfast. This is Wilfried's third marriage. Okay, was there like a shortage of men in this particular village? Because I know some really, really great guys who are still single and girls who are still single. And and this asshole is on wife number three. I mean, seriously, I, I don't get it. Yeah. I mean, looking at the photos, he looks average at best. Okay. I mean, looks are not everything. Don't get me wrong. I guess he was very charismatic and showered the women who, I guess, they were rather lonely. And he showered them with lots of attention and affection. I guess mm, it worked. Yeah, it worked. Yeah. Worked too well. Yeah. So Annika's family has no idea about the marriage. They only find out when one day Annika's mother tries to call her but only reaches the voicemail. And there Annika introduces herself as Wilfried's wife. Annika's mother is shocked. She just manages to leave a voice message asking, are you married? Annika calls back a while later, apologizes and states that her husband didn't want her family to know. Still, Annika's mother wants to visit her daughter and her new son-in-law and she drives all the way to Höxter with, you know, a little bit of money as a gift and a greeting card. But when she arrives, nobody seems to be home. Nobody answers the door. She throws the card and the money in the mailbox and she returns home. In December, finally, her daughter visits. Angelika drives Annika to see her mom, but instead of introducing herself, she just waits in the car. And when Annika's mother wants to go outside to meet the new family member, her daughter just stops her and says, trust me, you don't want to meet her. The two women hug and say goodbye. But what her mother doesn't know is that this would be the last time she sees her daughter. Soon after, Annika doesn't even call her mother anymore. She only communicates with her via text message. Ugh, this is heartbreaking. Imagine, and Annika's mother, she had no idea what her daughter's life looks like now. So, for example, Annika has to serve her husband. She has to look at him whenever he talks to her. There are fixed times every day where she has to serve him tea. She has to be submissive. She has to work hard, never is allowed to talk back. And if she fails to satisfy Wilfried or Angelika, they slap her. Later, abuse and torture grows even worse. They burn her. They pour boiling water over her. They torture her with electroshock. Soon Annika has to spend her nights chained to a radiator and later on they chain her in the bathtub. The reason why they do is because Wilfred, he gets annoyed that his wife has to use the toilet in the middle of the night and wakes him up with it. Oh my God. Mm. These these people are mon. I mean, this is... They're yeah. monsters. Monsters. They're, it's horrible. They're the worst. Very often Angelika is the main attacker and almost daily she finds new cruel ways to hurt the new woman in Wilfred's life. Like one time when Annika is chained in the bathtub, Angelika just turns on the faucet and nearly kills Annika. Wilfried turned off the running water last minute, preventing Annika from drowning. They barely feed her. They not only hurt her physically, but they also humiliate her. They laugh at her and they belittle her and they film most of it. The police will later find hours and hours of videos of the couple yelling and laughing at their victim, mocking her. Annika gets weaker and weaker. And one day she falls down and hits her head on the concrete in the yard. A couple of days later, after almost one year of torture, Annika is dead. She died on 4th of August 2014, chained to the bathtub in a bathroom where the windows had been bricked up long ago. Oh, Johanna, this is a really, this, this is heartbreaking. It's so sad and it's just so infuriating. It's... Yeah. <sighs> okay. You can do it. I know this is a bad, this is, I know <laughs> this was a really hard one. You know that you I usually too. don't have a lot of problems or I'm not easily shocked. I mean, I, I talk about cannibals and stuff like all the time, but this, this one really got to me. It's, it's yeah. hard. Okay. So. It's because well, you're not a sociopath. It's good. Well, it's supposed to get to you. God. <laughs> I know. So at first Angelica and Wilfried, they decide to put Annika's body in the freezer. And later on Angelica will explain calmly 
how she pushed Annika's head into the freezer a little bit further so that she would still have enough space to place a frozen pizza over Annika's face. Yeah, okay, like removing a pizza from the top of a head in your freezer isn't going to affect your appetite in any way. Who are these people? It's almost as if she's proud that she's so smart and so space efficient, you know? Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. So then Angelica starts to chop up the body little by little and they burn her in the oven in the living room. Oh, God. Okay. I thought you were going to say they added her to a stew. No, that's not Sorry. one. That's, that's not this kind of story. But Yeah. <laughs> no, Sorry. but um, it amazes her. And she says that it, she was amazed how warm the living room got when they burned their victim. Wow. And then the couple, they drive around in their car, throwing the ashes out of the window. No remains of Annika will ever be found. And Annika's mother has no idea that something bad had happened to her daughter. Angelica keeps texting her from Annika's phone. She only learns of her daughter's death almost two years later when she sees her son-in-law and his sister on the news. And I want to be very clear here, because maybe some of you listeners think that the mother should have known something was up or that she should have looked closer. But I want all of you to remember that we shouldn't judge her without really knowing the background. So I saw a few interviews with Annika's mother and... First of all, she's an extremely strong woman. She went to almost all trial days sitting there and listening to this kind of stuff. Oh, wow. And it appears to me that at first she tried to get through to her daughter, but that Wilfried had really charmed Annika too much. You could almost call it brainwashed, I guess. And I think her mother was probably glad that she had at least contact to her daughter, even if it was only via text. Nobody is to blame for what happened here other than Wilfried and Angelika. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, no, I wouldn't blame the mother at all. I'm just heartbroken for her. I mean, I I just, I feel like throughout this whole case, I just keep saying this is awful, this is awful. But, you know, seriously, this is, it's awful. I mean, there's nothing else you can say, but this is awful. This is just awful. Yeah, I'm here for you. This is awful. Okay. (laughs) So in February of 2016, Angelika and Wilfried, they meet their final victim. Susanne. And she too meets Wilfried via an ad, falls madly in love with him. We know the whole story is repeating and repeating over and over again. And she moves in with him and his sister. But unlike their other victims, they start to torture and abuse Susanne immediately, like from day one. And another devastating detail. They bring her back to her own apartment only a couple of days later. But Susanne returns to Höxter Bosseborn on her own free will. Oh, okay. Wow. It sounds like they really must have been incredibly skilled at brainwashing their victims because mm. this it's it feels like that feeling you get when you watch a horror movie when the person like runs upstairs. You know, it's like, no, don't. Like, mm-hmm. don't. Oh, it's okay. It's yeah. horrible. It's awful. And I mean, there even exists a contract signed by Susanna stating that she voluntarily subjected herself to the rules of her, quote, sweet Precious Wilfried. Ugh. Only two months later, on 21st of April, Susanne is so weakened that Angelica and Wilfried decide to drive her back to her own apartment. And I guess they do that because they didn't want to go through all the trouble of disposing of another body yet again. But on their way to Susanne's home, the car breaks down. And it's 10.30 p.m. when Angelica decides to knock at the door of a nearby house and she asks the people there to call a taxi for her. And then... All of a sudden, she changes her mind and she asks them to call an ambulance instead. The ambulance arrives and they rescue the nearly dead Susanne. Only a few hours later, on the 22nd of April 2016, Susanne dies in the hospital. Oh, God. Okay, so, yeah, it's terrible. But how, I mean, how do you think they're getting these women? Did they meet a whole bunch of... Of other women who they thought just weren't the right type? Like, do you think they were able to sense the personality type that would be the most receptive to, I don't know what the word is, to this sort of, you know, brainwashing and Mm. abuse? Or are they just so, so charming that they, you know, or were they like a duo of Ted Bundy level charm that it's awful? Well, that's the thing. I read somewhere that they that over time they placed over 500 ads. So, you know, I guess they must have been contacted by lots of women and probably they could somehow sense the perfect victim. Predators. Mm. But yeah. I think they really did that, like, I don't know, on a very subconscious level. I don't think oh, like, maybe. like 
like Wilfried with his very low IQ, I don't think he he was the master mind planning things. Like I know. Yeah. Anyway, five days later, the police finally arrest Wilfried and Angelika, and the house in Höxter Boseborn is all over the news. And that's the moment when Annika's mother sees it on TV. She doesn't understand. Isn't this the house her daughter and her son-in-law live? So she calls a family friend, a police officer, and he has to inform her that her daughter, Annika, died one and a half years earlier. Oh, that is just devastating. I can't even imagine. Thinking your child is alive and well and texting her? Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, no. So right from the beginning of the investigation, Angelika admits to abuse and torture, but she names Wilfried as the main perpetrator. She says she only helped in the attacks to satisfy her ex-husband. She just wanted to be left in peace by him. Quote, I didn't want to be tortured myself. I just wanted to clean the house or read the garden. End quote. Wilfred, on the other hand, paints a completely different picture. He says he was forced by his ex-wife Angelica. She was responsible for the torture, while he just wanted a harmonic family life. And as I mentioned before, when the police search the house, they find more than 12 thousand video and audio files evidence of the unbelievable abuse that was going on in the house wow and it seems it really does seem like both of them were equal and willing participants in this completely horrific abuse yes sure did and it also seems as if they often try to outdo each other you know what Uh, i mean yeah that's fun so the trial starts on October 26, 2016, and the former couple and accomplices Wilfried and Angelika are now opponents, each blaming the other for the crimes, each absolutely convinced that they are innocent and should not be punished at all. For example, Annika's mother, who has said she attended most of the trial, she looks at Wilfried and she shakes her head in disgust. And he looks at her and he just shrugs his shoulders and he points at Angelika as if his ex-wife was the only one to blame for what had happened. But Angelica stays cooperative. She hands the court two pages and on it 45 methods they use to torture Annika. So at first, Wilfred only admits that it might be possible that he had pushed the victims. And it will take a long time until he finally admits his aggression against women. Yeah, he he's obviously not going to, you know, admit that it's very Ted Bundy-like, isn't it? I never hurt anybody. I love women. I yeah, wouldn't... yeah. True. I would never harm anybody. So experts produce a psychological evaluation of the two accused, of course. And they conclude that Angelica is on the autism spectrum with an above average intelligence. She uses sex as an instrument of power and she is incapable of feeling remorse or empathy towards her victims. When a psychologist asks her if she thinks she could have run a concentration camp, she answers, quote, yes, and I would have earned a medal for it, end quote. Okay. She was at all times willing to obey every absurd rule that her ex-husband implemented, and she had no problem to enforce these rules with her victims. She is extremely dominant, and she wants to assert her power over others at all times. She even proves that during trial, where she often tries to get everyone to obey to her rules. But nevertheless, she is servile to her ex-husband, whose underwear she is still wearing during the detention while awaiting the trial. Oh, okay. Wilfred, on the other hand, is described as medically feeble-minded with dimension IQ of 59. His mental development can be compared to that of a kid in elementary school. He is not capable of feeling guilt or taking responsibilities for his actions. And he is always on the search for love and affection, even though he cannot fully comprehend these emotions. He is submissive, can't handle stress, and is overall very immature. He himself said, quote, I didn't know what's right or wrong. That's why therapy wouldn't be such a bad idea after all. End quote. Uh, yeah, that's bullshit, though. I th- don't you think he knew the difference between right and wrong? I think he knew the difference, but I do agree therapy wouldn't be such a bad idea for him. Yeah, oh, yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah, that goes without saying. But uh, yeah, it's... I mean, this man was capable of seducing and charming so many yeah. women, and you're trying to tell me that... I, I think he... Yeah. Yeah, I agree. So the thing is that when Angelica and Wilfried met, they kind of complemented each other perfectly, if that makes sense. You know, like Mm -hmm. a key and a lock, one of the experts called them. Both of them, they were not capable of having a healthy relationship. They were not able to experience real intimacy with each other. And that's why a highly complex system of gaslighting kind of filled the void in their relationship. 
Okay, so, well, gaslighting, if you're not familiar with the term, that's basically when you manipulate someone psychologically to make them really make them question their own sanity sometimes, make them question their memory or their perception of what what they think, which is generally what's really happening. So they were gaslighting each other or their victims or both? Well, they were gaslighting their victims. Um, Okay. Like through the very, very weird, highly complex rule system that they changed all the time and then told the victims, well, we told you that this is wrong and you did it anyway. Like these kind of things, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So they were gaslighting the victims. And even though they did it subconsciously, they practiced perfect gaslighting techniques. Yeah. As I said, the absurd and uh, irrational rules, endless discussions or, you know, the insidious punishments. Wilfred and Angelica were masters in dehumanizing their victims and breaking their will. What's also interesting to mention is that during the trial, neighbors were called as witnesses to make a statement. Now, most of them say things like, you know, yeah, they were weird. They kept to themselves. We had no idea what's going on. Uh, They never introduced themselves here. They were outsiders, blah, blah, blah. But there was at least one neighbor who witnessed Annika being abused outside of the house on at least one occasion. And they did nothing. And, you know, I get it. People don't want to endanger themselves. People don't want to in- get involved in horrible things. But please, I really, I mean that. If you ever witness somebody in trouble, please call the authorities. It can literally save lives. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I mean, that's just, it's appalling. I mean, it really, seriously, if you see something, say something. You can always call in an anonymous tip, you know? Yeah. Nobody asks you to endanger yourself, you know, be no. smart about it. But hell, yeah, don't yes. look away. No, no, no. So the trial ends on 5th of October 2018. For murder in two cases and for failure to render assistance, Angelica is sentenced to 13 years in prison. Wilfred is sentenced to 11 years. Due to his low IQ, he cannot be held accountable for his crimes completely and he will spend his sentence and probably the rest of his life in prison in a psychiatric clinic. While Angelica grinned while receiving her sentence, Wilfred covered his face with his hands. And afterwards he says, quote, I want to apologize to all my victims. If I would have known better, I would have done something about it, of course. But I didn't know what's right or wrong. I want impunity. I want to thank my mother, stepfather and my lawyer. And I don't have any words for Angelica and her lies. End quote. Huh. And do we really believe that he was that easily led astray, though? Because it sounds to me like, all right, so she was on the autism spectrum, but she was a violent sociopath who happened to be on the autism spectrum, yeah. right? And he might have had developmental delays or low IQ, but he is also a violent sociopath who has developmental delays and a low IQ, right? So yeah. I don't know. I, you, It's not enough time. I just would have thought both should have gone to prison for life. Oh, I absolutely agree. And I also want to as you said, the the low IQ or her being on the autism spectrum, that was not the thing that made them do what they were doing. They are wild, despicable people who feel only sorry for themselves. Yeah. Also, remember, he was already in prison for torturing his first wife. And at that time, he didn't, he didn't know Angelica. So I really definitely don't see him as that, you know, poor guy who was forced to do these things. Yeah, absolutely not. Yeah, there's no there's I have no sympathy for for either of these people. It's terrible. And I really I just don't understand why their sentences are so light. It's not enough time for two murders, 11 years for two murders. Mm -hmm. And plus all the torture. And what I forgot to mention during the trial, Wilfred acted like he's, you know, this shy, nervous guy with a lisp. And he was always talking very quietly and, you know, stuttering. He only did the things he did because Angelica told him so. But the video and audio evidence, and they had plenty of it, that really showed a very different side of Wilfried, a very aggressive and dominant side towards his victims. Mm. Now, I agree, of course, Angelica should have received a way harder sentence. Unfortunately, here, life sentence still only means 25 years max, um, unless the sentence calls for a subsequent preventive detention. Uh, so they're both still in, they're both, I guess, obviously still in prison now. Yes, of course, because the as I said, the trial it just happened last yeah. year. It just yeah, happened, yeah. and thank God they still have quite a few years ahead of them. And as I said, um, Wilfred probably will never leave the psychiatric clinic. He will no. spend really the rest of he his should. life there. Yeah, he should. But she should spend her the rest of her life in prison. Your prisons are nice too. Like yeah. 
Can we send her some, like, North Korea? I bet it has a little <laughs> bit of space. Or like, And you know what? She was smiling when she got the sentence because she knew that's nothing. 13 years? I don't know when she when she can ask for parole. Probably, like, after eight years, seven years, I guess. Oh, I, that, that's just a wild guess now. Yeah, yeah. And she was smiling because she knew she, she got off easy. Oh, yeah. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> This is not the first time in our podcast that we talked about toxic and abusive relationships. And I'm not talking about the relationship between Wilfred and Angelica, because I think they very much deserved each other. But I mean, like They're the victims. victims. Yeah, mm. I think it's a uh, great advice to, you know, don't move in with somebody that you just met. Do not marry someone just a few weeks after you met, because people can fake their personalities for a couple of weeks with out any problem and there are horrible people out there who prey on people who just try to find love and be happy oh absolutely and you know meet their friends or their family or make sure your friends and family have met them you know see what they think of them don't be untrusting but just you know be careful mm -hmm. um and as always there is information on domestic violence help in our facebook group so that's there if you need it this was so sad so please tell me something good Oh, God, researching this case was so hard, really. Yeah. I'm not easily shocked by our cases, but this one really uh, was horrible for me. I definitely needed something good this week. So the best thing this week was that my sister went on vacation. Now you might think, uh, how is your sister going on vacation a good thing for you? I mean, better you go on vacation or something. No, but let me explain. So my sister is a single mom. And she she had her fair share of bad relationships. Well, actually, she was a single mom because she's now dating a guy for over a year now, I think. And they just recently moved in together. And he is awesome. Like, I really, really like what I see so far. He's an organic farmer, which I find super fascinating and, nice. and great because they just brought me a lot of vegetables and jam last week. Jam like in marmalade, not like in my dog. Yeah. <laughs> So my sister and my nephew, they just moved to the countryside with him and they all seem to be like really happy, you know. And now yeah. the three of them went on vacation to Croatia together and my sister and my nephew, they sent me videos and they seem so happy. And seeing them like this really filled me with so much joy. Oh, yeah, that's the best. There's nothing better than seeing somebody that you really love happy. Like it's better than when you're happy yourself, you know, yeah. it's the best. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Oh, what that's about great. You? Mine is actually similar. So I had two happy things that happened last week. The first is that we've been undergoing this garage project. I'm calling it the Garage Mahal project, <laughs> but it's the first phase of it is kind of done. Like we sort of have most of a garage. It took a long time to save and plan and design it, but it's really, it's like the only thing that was on Paul's like want list when we were house hunting <laughs> it was a garage. So I'm just, I'm, it's nice to see him so happy about it. He's like a kid. At Christmas, his eyes get all happy and shiny. And it was built off site. And so, because it, it was more affordable to do it that way. And they brought in like a crane and hoisted the walls up. It was cool. It's cool because and, uh, I gotta move there. It's enough space you could, for me. Yeah. To there, yeah. It's, a, it's a big garage. <laughs> it is. We have a lot of stuff though, but like just like the snow blower is big. And then we have well, a I lot of. I live upstairs of... because, yes, the garage has an upstairs. You could, yeah, the garage has an upstairs. I think it's <laughs> going to become a poker room. And he's talking now about putting a bathroom up there. So we'll see how it goes. <laughs> I don't, so it's, it's, it's his, um, it's, he's going to, he's going to leave me and move to the garage. <laughs> it's very, um, Frida Kahlo. You know? I know. It is. <laughs> You're going to have to have like a bridge from your house oh. to the garage. Oh, he'd love a bridge from the house to the garage. Don't cut that. I don't want him to get any more ideas. He can't afford to upgrade this thing anymore. No, the inside, he's going to take his time, you know, over and do stuff to finish it and whatnot. So it'll be good. But the other thing that happened is I think some of my family in England are coming for both Thanksgiving and Christmas this year. So that makes me very, very happy. I just, I really, I love having family and friends all over the world. But it's also, it's really hard not seeing the people that you love as often as you'd like because they're a six hour flight away mm. you know so I'm just really happy about really really ha I haven't spent a Christmas with my nephew since he was three and he just turned 16 it's exciting I'm happy for you it's always great to have family over especially during the holidays yeah it's it's just it's going to be really nice I'm looking forward to it even though they don't like the cold and they're coming to Boston <laughs> 
just said to Paul, I hope we get a really big blizzard. Like, I hope we get one really good snowstorm so they can experience, like, a real New England, Mm -hmm. you know, nor'easter. All right. I have to say I'm happy we're through this. Yeah. Um, Please rate us. If you like what you're hearing here, review us. That would help us out a lot. Subscribe. Please come say hi in the Fresh Hell Facebook group, which is it's really turning out to be such like a nice, fun group of people, isn't it? Yes, it is. It yes. really is. It's like now it's like when I'm feeling stressed out during case research, I like pop into the Facebook group to see what kind of memes and stuff people <laughs> are talking about. And it's just it just relaxes me a little. So that's nice. And all of the photos from our cases. Do we have a photo of his nibs there in the in the blue bike shorts? Uh, yeah, we have a photo. Yeah. So we'll post I don't know that. if people want to see that. Oh, but we we want to see it anyway. Yeah, we're going to have to. It's it's an embarrassing photo of this nutcase. Of course, we're going to share it, share it far and wide. Um, but yeah, you know, come say hi. And as we said in the past, you know, this was a this was a tough episode. And there is a pinned post at the top of our Facebook group with lots of contact information for all kinds of resources, including uh, domestic violence and abuse. Yeah, uh, also international, I think, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yep. yep. Got. We've got places from all over. And if you have any links to add, uh, please let us know, and we will very gladly do that. You can email us at freshhellpodcast at gmail.com. We really hope the rest of your week is wonderful. And until next time, please remember that if you yourself are going through any kind of hell, keep going. Tschüss. Bye. <laughs>